right guys, welcome back to the sawmill. Today's Monday, April 23rd. It's been raining for the biggest part of the morning. I'm just now really getting ahead of what I want to get done today. And I had a video out since uh, last Monday's when I put out the Georgia sawing video. And I actually put out another blog last night on the website showing some pictures from that event. So if you want to see those photos, just go over to the blog. The link down below will get you there. And it's got some pictures from the event in Georgia. And I talked about some other things that went on down there. It didn't make it to the video. And uh, also, in reference to the vlog, I'm going to try to get some more content over there. I'm going to try to do at least two or three uh, blog entries a week. I enjoy writing those. And judging by the comments, look like people enjoy reading them as well. You can comment on those. Because when you get to the bottom of it, there's a little comment box. You just have to enter your name and maybe your email. I'm not sure. Maybe just your name. And you can comment there on the blog and ask any questions. And if I can't answer it, somebody on there will probably know the answer. Now the sawmill footage you saw at the first of this video was from last year on July the 5th. And that's when we sawed up this maple. This is soft maple, also referred to as sugar maple around here. And it had a little bit of spotting as you can tell from the video. It turned out pretty nice. That log had been down for about one year. And the spalting had started to occur here on the outside of the boards. And I'm doing a little experiment here. And hopefully in about seven or eight days from today, we'll see if that experiment worked or not. The reason I'm doing the video on it is because a lot of you guys out there might be interested in doing some spalted slabs or spalted lumber. This works, so maybe it can help you guys in the future when you're trying to achieve that. Because that's one thing about spalted wood. You can let a log lay down for a year or two and it's going to spalt. But sometimes it spots too much and it starts to rot. So that's one thing you got to be careful with whenever you're letting your timber spot out in the log yard or wherever you got it stored at. Because if you let it sit there too long, it's going to rot too much and just be a total waste. But if you get it just right, the spotting is going to be all the way through. Now on these slabs right here, the spotting was okay. It didn't go all the way through like I hope it would have went. But there was some spotting there. This experiment I ran on these things hopefully will make the spotting come all the way through it. So let me bring the camera in and show you guys what these slabs look like. They look horrible. Horrible. I mean, they look terrible on the outside, but they're still solid. So that's good right there. We didn't have a total loss right there because I wasn't sure when I pulled them off if they were going to be solid or not. So we have some good solid wood here. Now we just need to find out if the spalting went more than it did originally when we sawed them. Okay, now these slabs are right at eight quarter on the thickness. They vary in width and they all came from the same log. And as you guys saw before how the spalting was, right now you can't see anything. They look terrible. They're weathered. The colors changed on them a whole lot. They're still solid, which is the big thing. I'm hoping the spalting really took hold and went further into the board and maybe even got even better than it was originally. What we did was after we sawed these up last July, I put these on a trailer and I dead stacked them. What I mean by that was there's no stickers between it. They're just flat on top of each other. I let them sit there for about six months and just sit there and dry on their own being dead stacked. You can see by the front of these boards or on the faces rather, there's a lot of mold that developed. I'm hoping the colors really developed a whole lot during that process. We will find out here in a few days after the kiln process is over this worked or not. Now the moisture content on these slabs is 13%. It was really low actually when it came off the sawmill. I think it was like 28 because like I said this log had laid for about a year before I even sawed it up. So the moisture content is at the perfect level for kiln drying. You want your slabs or lumber to be less than 20% if you're doing, if you're doing air dried wood into a kiln. Everything in the kiln today is less than 20%. All of it's around 14 to 15%. With the exception of the barn wood I've got in here just for sterilization, I think it's around 9%. But it's been hanging on a barn for 100 years and you would expect that. Got the kiln loaded here. Got some black walnut on the bottom. Got the barn wood here in the middle. And these eight maple slabs on top and if you're wondering why i'm drying different things right here the reason being everything here has been air dried to less than 20 percent of these species will interrupt the other one while they're drying so there's no problem with mixing these up that's where you got to be careful when kiln drying you want to air dry everything to less than 20 percent if you're not doing green and once you get less than 20 percent Unless you're mixing like pine in here, which you can't do, or something like that, you'll be okay. This barn wood here, like I said, is about 9% moisture content. Once it dries down, it'd get to probably 6 or 7. The main reason it's in here is just for the sterilization process to kill the buds in it. People on top is about 15. It will easily go down to 8%. One inch walnut boards on the very bottom, they're at 14% this morning. They'll have no trouble getting down there either. If this stuff is green, you would never mix species and thicknesses like this. Now, even if I had some air dried pine, I would not put it in here. I'd try to keep hardwoods with hardwoods and softwoods with softwoods. As long as this stuff isn't green, you're good to go. That's why I like to air dry first. 
parameters because you can mix thicknesses and species not to worry about anything going wrong. Now if I had some pine that was air dried I still wouldn't add it in here because of all the resin and the sap in pine and having to set the pitch when you're done. And these hardwoods here they dry pretty easily and when you air dry them first all the bad things have already happened so you're good to go on that point. We will come back in about eight days it will take seven days probably to dry this lumber and then i'll do 24 hours to sterilize it at 150 degrees and then we should have some good slabs and some good dry lumber and once these are done we'll take these out of the kiln and get the fast tool raw sander out that i've showed in the past and we'll clean them up on both sides hopefully it's some really nice spotted wood i'm not sure how these are going to look when they come out you can't tell for nothing right now with all this weather and all this gray color and the mold and stuff on it so i'm hoping for some really unique slabs out of this and maybe in the future i can do that same process to achieve better spalting so we'll see on that if you guys running sawmills out there and selling slabs this may be something that can help you in the future or maybe something you don't want to think about doing the time i clean these up they may be a total loss and then again they may look really nice but i'm thinking judging by them still being solid the spalting should have gotten better on these and actually went all the way through the middle of the board so we'll see in a few days on that well I about forgot i've got one more pretty thick maple slab here to put on the very top it's i think 12 quarter on the thickness if you guys noticed the audio has improved on these videos lately i finally got me a wireless microphone to wear here no more having to stare at the camera and kind of scream at it whenever i'm trying to talk to you guys over the sawmill or doing stuff like this i can be working and looking the other way and talk right in this microphone you guys can hear it pretty clear so finally some proper audio i had a question the other day it might have been an email i can't remember what it was to be honest with you he asked me what the sticker dimensions was and these are just little pine fern strips you get at Lowe's. And uh, let me get my tape and we'll measure them right here. I think they're like a half inch by two inch or something like that. So, to so answer that question, they are actually inch and a half by around three quarters. Pretty good sticker size right there. Different people use different things. I know a guy who uses tobacco sticks around here for stickers. But as long as you get a good air movement between the boards, they're not too thick to where you're losing a lot of uh, area due to the sticker thickness you're okay but these are at Lowe's bundles of eight are like seven dollars I've got tons of them around here and uh, some people cut their own stickers I just like to buy them from Lowe's so they're all the same dimension they're kiln dried and it saves time let's get that big maple in here put it on top that'll help keep this whole stack weighted down this is the big boy here I think the thickness on this one three inches nice thick maple right here check that to be sure 12 quarter width is around 12 and the timber length seven feet as you can see on this one there's still some spalting right here on the sides from when it was sawed up but this one I stickered I didn't dead stack yet so we'll just omit it whenever it comes out of the kiln as being part of our little experiment here we're doing. Well, that's going to finish up this load. I think this is about 600 board feet total, maybe 700. And we'll go ahead and baffle the load and seal the doors up and close the vents and get the kiln to run and start drying some wood. But uh, I'll keep you guys updated throughout the week. I'm not sure tomorrow what I'm going to be doing. I was, I was hoping to be sawmilling today, but it's rained all morning here. This is the first time today it's not rained any, so I'll probably be back on the mill tomorrow, if not Wednesday. And I'll keep you guys updated throughout the week on whatever video I'm doing. We'll do a little trip out to the kiln and check the moisture on everything and see how everything's going. This should be a pretty easy load to dry because it's like I said, it's air dried down to 14%. So nothing to really go wrong after that point. And uh, let's get it baffled up here. This kiln's pretty maintenance free when you're running it. There's not a lot you have to do to it all besides just monitor the temperature. So there's one thing you do have to do is out here on the wall where these instruments are. Now if you guys have already seen the video on the kiln build, this is old hat to you, but some of you might not be familiar with it. And there's two probes right here on this wall. It's two different instruments. This is the dry bulb sensor, which tells you the temperature of the kiln at all times. And this is the wet bulb sensor, which tells you the humidity inside the kiln at all times. There's a small little wick right here that goes over this. It goes down in this reservoir. And over time, this wick gets pretty crusty by a lot of the stuff coming out of the wood, just the overall conditions. There's nothing you can do about it. 
you just have to pull it up every once in a while and cut that nasty part off. That way you get a very accurate reading here when you're checking your humidity inside the kiln, which is very important. And another thing is this reservoir here, the water, will definitely evaporate over time. It's pretty empty right now and you gotta keep it as full as you can get it to the very top. And usually while this thing is running, I come out here and open up the door once a day and check moisture content levels and make sure everything looks okay and this thing needs filled just about every day. And to address baffling here, I always get a question about that also. You want the air to come out of those fans and top of the kiln unit, come around and not go on top of these bores, but be forced down here through the stack. That gives you a constant cycle of warm air getting circulated through this stack, heating the wood up, pulling the moisture out, and making everything pretty efficient. Without this baffle on the top, the air would just be everywhere. You can't really control where it was going and make a mess. I don't think it'd even dry it correctly. So that's why these baffles are here. You can use plywood or anything you can think of to baffle the load, but this was left over from the kiln build. So it really makes good use of them without throwing them away. And they're a lot lighter than plywood. Now we're back here behind the kiln at the control center. The first thing I want to do is cut on my fans. This switch will cut on both of the auxiliary fans on the fan deck and the three box fans on the floor. Hear those cutting on. Back here in the back, probably won't be able to see it. There's a switch for these external heating lights that I have in there, the heat lamps. That will help us get the temperature up a lot faster on the kiln so we can start pulling out the water. Now here's the main controller here for the kiln. The heater and the compressor are both off right now. The vents, I don't have that feature on this kiln, which I leave that off on the time. The humidification button also, you don't have to worry about that either. The compressor button and the heat button is the only two buttons you have to really worry about or kind of do some configurations on. Let's go ahead and turn it on. All right, if I can get focused in here, there we go. So what we're looking at here is all the different readings. The heater's showing on, but it's actually not on yet until we cut it on. That's the default setting that shows on there. The vents are off, as I don't have the powered vents on this model. The compressor's off. The humidification button stays on, even though it's always turned off. I'm not sure why it does that. It's never on. It always shows on for some reason. Now our temperatures inside the kiln. Right now the dry bulb temperature is 61.1 degrees. Humidity is 55. So we'll go ahead and do our settings here for the kiln. First configuration is going to be the dry bulb. We want to set that at 120 degrees. Okay. Now the wet bulb we're going to set at 75. And what that means is when the kiln reaches 120 degrees, it will start trying to equalize that temperature and not go much above that. But when the humidity reaches 75 degrees, the compressor will cut on and start pulling out the moisture out of the air. So there we go. That's all you got to do is sit back and wait and watch those numbers rise and make sure everything's going okay and check it every 24 hours. And uh, when you air dry your wood like that first, it's pretty simple. Not a lot of math to do, not a lot of steps in the process. That's why I like to air dry it first.